Okay. So today we're going to be moving from Adam and Eve to Noah and through Noah's story, uh, if everything works out as planned. So in a sense, our kind of major theme today is going to be seeing how the text narrates this development of God's relationship with humanity and how that becomes more precise, both in who it's directed towards and what's required of those people. Okay, so we're going to kind of see how the text is developing this relationship. Okay. So we finished the two creative creation narratives, and we saw how the second one ended with the experience of exile, right? Adam and Eve being exiled from the Garden of Eden. And we talked about how those myths, especially that second one, provides etiological explanations, right? Etiology being that fun word to talk about um, their kind of narrative explanations for why things are the way they are, right? Start with that. Is that okay? Oh, no, 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 you're fine. I just want to make sure I don't touch you. We talked about how that story provided these etiological explanations, such as what? The what fall. Was, I mean, the... Why we wear clothes. Oh, okay. Why snakes slither. Why snakes slither. Pain in childbirth. Right. We talked about all these ideological explanations. Mm -hmm. We talked even about how that narration of exile from the garden because of the breaking of this agreement between God and humanity resulted in exile, which might also be, in a sense, an explanation for Israel's experience in exile, which we'll get to. Right? And it was an exile that resulted from the breaking of a command, right? Breaking of a certain relationship. And that's what we're going to see developing today. So right after Adam and Eve, we get Cain and Abel, right? These are the two firstborn children um, that we get in the story. Uh, Cain is born first and then Abel. And Eve says this really cool thing when Cain is born. And she said, I have procured a man with the help of the Lord, right? The, the Hebrew here is, oops, is kana. I have procured, I have received, I have created a man with the help of the Lord. The Hebrew word for Cain, it's kind of this letter and this letter is the same. They just look different when they're at the end and in the middle of a word, is Kain. And so, again, this idea of naming, right? Identity being tied up with a name, right? I have received or um, possessed a man with the help of the Lord, and so I will name him Cain. I have Kana, a man, so I will name him Kayan. Okay. Now, it's going to be interesting, too, because this word is also going to pop up when we start talking about Exodus. Okay. So it'll be interesting to see how this word comes into play with that experience. So, I'm sorry, so they mean different things? So they mean different things. Kana means um, to receive or to get. This is the kind of meaning which this name is meant to evoke. Oh, Right, okay. does that make sense? So this name is supposed to make you think of this. Okay. Right, I received a man. So it's almost like, um, I'm trying to think, if you if you said like, I, if in English it would be really weird, but like I received a man, so I will call him like Receptor, or whatever, if you were to give him a superhero name, I don't know. But you see like, there's a name that's based on this word, based on this idea, to make you think about that. Right, so what I'm saying, what's the second one? This is his name. This is this is what we get. This is in English. Sorry. Oh. Okay. This is how you spell his name in Hebrew and how you would say it in Hebrew. But I'm saying in the first one is Abel. This, no, this first one. Oh, is, so they're both Cain. Okay. Um, to receive. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. I could. This would help a lot. Gotcha. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I know right. that too. <laughs> there no, no, no. See, like your questions and confusions can oftentimes be everybody's confusions yeah. and questions. All right. So this is the word means to receive and to get. This is the word on which Cain's name is based. Gotcha. And what we get with Cain and Abel, we're not going to get too much into their story and dig into that because we obviously have to get a little bit further. 
is we have the first sibling rivalry. And this is going to pop up again and again mm -hmm. throughout the biblical text. Throughout life. How about that too? World history. Right. The sibling rivalry. <laughs> right. Both of them offer sacrifices. God likes Abel's. Cain's really bummed out, so he kills his brother, like we all do when we get uh, sad. <laughs> um, so he kills his brother. God confronts him and says, you know, where's your brother? Um, either playing stupid or just being a little more anthropomorphic. Um, Cain says, I don't know, my, my brother's keeper. And at, at which point God confronts him and um, in a sense curses him, right? Mm -hmm. Says that his blood will be on your hands. But at the same time offers him some protection mm -hmm. so that he doesn't then get killed. From that, the text kind of snowballs as far as sin goes, right? And depending on which genealogy you follow, you either get, we get, the text either takes us from Adam to a fellow named Lamech, and there's, this goes seven generations in one genealogy, and right, you guys know genealogy is like a family tree, mm -hmm. right, tracing one person to the next, or we can go, oops, Adam to Noah, in 10 generations. Put that down here. Okay. And to let you know, Noah is Lamech's son. Now, in one of these genealogies, it, in this first one, right, it goes Adam to Cain to Lamech. And the other one, it goes Adam Seth to Lamech. Right? But in both of these cases, and there's a lot of overlap between names here. Right. There's, I think, three or so names from each of these that kind of overlap between the genealogies. So, you know, I don't think either of them are going for historicity. Remember, that's not something that we are seeing um, the Hebrew writers being really concerned with, is like historical accuracy as far as like who's um, so-and-so's father. But what we have here are really ideological numbers. Mm. Right? Seven is this number of completeness. Right? And 10 kind of functions in a really similar way. Think of you have 10 commandments. Um, also, we have 10 generations from Adam to Noah. The text then gives us 10 generations from Noah to Abraham, <laughs> right? So it was Adam, then Eve, and not Cain. It was Adam, Eve, a whole bunch of other people, and then Cain. Say that one more time. <laughs> when humans was created, it was Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are the other humans? Then you get, then you get Cain and Abel. Right? Mm -hmm. And then Seth comes, in a sense, the text tells us to replace mm -hmm. Abel. Okay. But then, as far as who comes next, these two, there's two different genealogies and they disagree. <clears throat> they conflict with each other because you have names that overlap. You have some, you have Lamech, for example, descending from Cain in this one, and you have Lamech descending from Seth in this one. So, so, how was Cain able to leave? where he was at and go and start his own. And that's the thing, like this is the reason the text isn't meant to be read historically, because the text isn't concerned with saying like, wait, but Adam and Eve don't have any daughters, so how are they procreating, mm -hmm. right? The text isn't really concerned with that kind of way of narrating history, right? Remember, the text is focusing on explaining reality, showing how we got to a certain place, okay? And the reason I wanna focus on Lamech here is because the text tells us a very interesting thing about him. If you look at um, chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Maybe you use technology. You can. You may. Yes. I highly recommend bringing in the, um, the study Bible if you can, because it's a better translation. And, um, and we'll all kind of be using the same 23? one. 23 and 24 of, ver of chapter 4. Yeah, so we're looking at... Or 23 mm -hmm. to 24. You get Lamech with this nice little soliloquy, right? this nice little aside. And you have Lamech saying to his wives, because we're in a polygamous society and that's okay, <laughs> um, Adam and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man. This is, this is kind of coming after uh, Lamech being descended from Cain in this example. Um, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. 
if Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Right? This kind of spiraling out of control. We have first Cain murdering his brother because of some kind of sibling rivalry, and now we have Lamech simply killing somebody for hurting him. Right? Things have snowballed. Things have gotten seriously bad. And that's why we have this kind of like this seven number here. Right? It's like from Cain, from Adam to Lamech, things are just totally and wholly out of control. Right? And this is and Noah will then come after this. Right? This next one puts Noah, wants to focus much more on Noah, right? This ten generation one. Because if we look at Chapter 5, verse 29. We have Noah, or we have Lamech pop up again. Right? Uh, verse 28. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he became the father of a son. He named him Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. We have here, let me make sure I've got this right. Okay. The word for Noah, I'm writing way too big today, sorry. Looks like this in Hebrew, right? This is Noah in Hebrew. The word that gets used for relief in this passage is Naham. Right, so this is, in a sense, Noah. This is Naham, right? I want relief from the word. This one shall bring us relief. Mm -hmm. Right, talking about Noah. Okay, so this is why, in the same way that Eve names Cain Cain because of Cana, so does Lamech name his son Noah because he will bring Naham, he'll bring relief. Right, does that make sense? So here, his identity is kind of given him by the text, right? This is his identity because this is what he will do. Now, it's fun, however is this word can have a couple different meanings, and the text plays with that. If you look at chapter 6, verse 5, right, this is when God is now surveying how awful humanity has gotten. Right, God is saying nothing but humanity, or nothing but wickedness. Uh, verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of human, or humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of their thoughts was only evil continually, and the Lord was sorry, that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Okay? The word for to be sorry or to regret, same word in Hebrew. Naham. So the text here is playing with Noah's name, right? Saying, you have Lamech saying, I hope that Noah is the one who turns back the curse. Right, who makes it so that the curse that we're experiencing where it's hard to work the ground is now reversed. Right? And in a sense, Noah is going to be that. But not because Lamech wants relief so that he doesn't have to work. But Noah will reverse the curse because God is sorry that he has made humanity because things are so bad. You see that how the text is kind of playing with that name? And this is what happens. All right, this is where we get that flood story. Now, we talked about how flood myths, it makes a lot of sense that there would be flood myths in the ancient Near East, right? Because if we look at where major civilizations developed in the ancient world, so we see how in these early civilizations, right, they developed around water, right, because you need water to survive. The only thing with water is that water is chaotic, right? Water floods, right? You can't control it. Right, especially these early stages in, in human history. Right? And so flood narratives are going to make sense. This is the reason why we have so many flood narratives in the ancient world. It's because civilizations are around these unpredictable, chaotic waters that they have not learned to dam and control yet to prevent flooding like this. And this is why each of them as well talks about worldwide floods. Because in the ancient Near East, you are only get a, going to get around by foot, maybe by horse. Right? So your world is going to be much more limited in scope than we think of as the world today. Right? So the world's going to have the scope, and this is why these floods get narrated as worldwide um, floods. Right? And also because 
you take your experience and you say, this is the experience of the world, right? This is how we understand the world. This is how we understand God to act. And because God doesn't just act in one way, in one place, in one particular way, and act over here completely different, right? These floods are going to be worldwide. So looking at, let's, we're going to kind of do a little bit today what we did with the Enuma Elish, right? Is where we compare these two different floods. And we'll get our nice little... Um, Flood waters here setting the uh, setting the mood for us. <laughs> what are some similarities you all saw between the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Enuma Elish? You can even list some of the ones that we already put up. Good. So we're just gonna we're just gonna create a nice little list here. Similarities. Right, we have releasing birds. What else? Specific instructions on how to build the boat. Yeah, they're really detailed. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's really interesting that the tradition has kind of preserved that. Those kind of specific details, you know, and that level of specificity. Right, what, what else? What, what and who is on the boat? In what sense? Okay, so it outlines who should be on the boat, right? What are some ways just kind of going off this that it's a little different? Hmm? Uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh? Uh, not necessarily. He's commanded to take uh, a seed of every of every living creature. So in the same way that Noah takes everything, right? Um, so too does Utnapishtim. Yeah, I just realized this. Let me give you guys a little background for this story um, that I think you all read. Um, but in the same way that we kind of did Epic of Gilgamesh, it's kind of good to have just a really basic understanding of the story just on the, out, um, on the outset. The Epic of Gilgamesh is, of course, an epic, and it follows Gilgamesh around. And Gilgamesh comes across this guy called Utnapishtim. Put up his name over here. We have Utnapish. I think this is how you spell his name. If anybody has their vote, correct me. Right. We have Utnapishtim. And Utnapishtim is the one who tells, um, I'm getting all my names mixed up, Gilgamesh about this worldwide flood. Right? He tells Gilgamesh, look, let me tell you what happened. Right, so this is the story being related from him. Gilgamesh isn't in this flood, right, in the same way that Noah is in the flood. The story is really about this guy. He's just telling Gilgamesh. Okay. And he relates the story where the gods are in their celestial dwelling places. And you guys remember in the Enuma Elish, why did um, Ea, or was it Ea? No, I'm sorry. Um, oof. Right. No, I can't keep blanking on names. Uh, the one guy get so upset and want to destroy all the gods. Is that Yah? Yeah. What is Yah? It's okay. Absu. Absu. Thank you. Absu. Absu got really upset and wanted to kill all the gods. Why? They were loud. They were loud. Same thing happens here. Right? The gods are upset because humanity is loud and clamorous and noisy. Right? And it kind of makes you wonder what, what the deal is with being noisy that gets everybody so upset, you know, in these, in the Babylonian myths. Um, one possibility of this is that instead of humanity doing what it is supposed to do, right, which is taking care of the gods, they're doing the opposite and disturbing the gods, right? Humanity is meant to take care of them you know, with food and, all, and worship and all these kinds of things, and they're doing the opposite of that. They're neglecting their purpose, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it could also just be a way for the text to say that things are chaotic, right? That things are so chaotic, and the gods, in a sense, want order in the same way that our Genesis 1, God wanted order, right? So there's this, there's this idea that here gods are either desiring order or worship 
And these two ideas are really closely connected, as we saw in Genesis 1. So anyways, they're really upset. They want to kill all the gods. Now, one of the gods, Ea, hears about this. And he's like, hmm, this, this really isn't going to end well um, if we do this. And he has kind of, he kind of goes behind the gods' back to tell Utnapishtim that this is going to happen. Now he does it in a really sneaky way. He tells him in a dream first, and then he pretends to be like a fence or something, and kind of whispers. You know, like, he's, or he's like talking to himself, right? He's pretending to be something. He, he's, he's talking to himself so that you know, Pishtim can overhear, right? It's like a really sly way of gossip, right? I was just talking to you know Joe over here. I mean, couldn't help that you know Sally heard me. Right? This is kind of his tactic. Uta Pishtim hears him. And decides, oh, it's just this is really what's going to go down. I should I should start working on this boat, right? And he builds the boat, right? In order for him and in this story, all of his kind of relatives and even the boat builders can survive, right? Utnapishtim and his and his little um, clan survived the flood. After which. Um, they, they, of course, have a sacrifice, which is right a similarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both of them offer sacrifices. At which point, all the gods kind of clamor around the sacrifice. Why do the gods clamor around the sacrifice like flies at the end of the Epic of Gilgamesh's account? Think about what human humanity is for. Nobody sacrificed. Yeah. They hadn't eaten, right? The gods haven't eaten in like I forget, seven days or a little over seven days. The gods haven't eaten at all. And so when Utnapishtim and his family offer these sacrifices, the gods clamor around like flies, right? And this is why we learned that Ea told Utnapishtim and went behind the gods' back because he knew if all of humanity was wiped out, there would be no one to take care of the gods. And this is why Utnapishtim and his family is saved. Not because they're special or anything like that, but purely so that the gods could have somebody to take care of them. <laughs> right? And that's kind of the general thrust of the Epic of Gilgamesh's account of, of the flood. Okay? So kind of talking about the, these differences, or similarities and differences. Right? We've got releasing birds, details about how to build it, what and who, and we have some, some similarities here. The who's different though, right? Because with the Noah account, it's just Noah and his family, nobody else, right? Whereas with the Epic of Gilgamesh, we have a little bit bigger crowd getting on the boat. So we'll, say, we'll just say that bigger crowd. Uh, and they both offer sacrifices, right? It says God that is, God is happy about the sacrifice, it doesn't say he is, you know, clamoring around it, right? Because for the Israelite mindset, you don't have a God who needs sacrifices in the same way that the Mesopotamian uh, religions understood that. What else? What else would be a similarity or difference in these two accounts? Just from what I just set up here from your reading. Wasn't it the time of the flood? Wasn't that different? Yeah. yeah. And our biblical account yeah, is much longer. Mm -hmm. Right. The waters rage seven days yeah. in the Epic of Gilgamesh. The waters rage 40 in the biblical account. Let's see here. Like we had up here earlier, both boats land on mountains. I can change my extra credit count. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's a lot of similarities here. Let's talk about how the waters are narrated as flooding the earth. Do you remember, y'all remember this this picture? This idea of separating the waters, right, and then having kind of what we understand as the earth kind of between these two. In both accounts, 
water is coming from above and from below. Right? In a sense, we are returning to that primordial chaos. Right? And by these waters receding, in a sense, God is recreating the world. Okay, it's kind of what the story... The flood isn't just a wiping the slate clean. It's a recreation. Right? And in a sense, the Enigma of Leech kind of narrates a similar thing. Right? Tiamat's body has come together, and now the waters recede, and we're going to start over here. Right? So we have this idea of recreation. The waters of chaos have converged. They're going to recede, and we're going to restore a new order. Oh, they took the boat down to a river. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So we could say like release points or whatever. Yeah. We also have like humans closing the door versus mm -hmm. God closing the door. Good. Let's talk about that rainbow and a promise. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, there is no rainbow. There is instead Ishtar's necklace. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't say that the gods are promising anything. Mm -hmm. There is no promise given. It's only that this necklace is given so the gods will remember what happened. right? And hopefully by remembering how awful this time without sacrifices was, they won't do it again. Right? Like, that was really awful. Let's not try that again. This necklace, OK, we remember. <laughs> This is our classic conception of what the text is telling us in, G in Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. That God sets a rainbow in the sky as this promise. The text, however, while it's implying rainbow, does not use the word rainbow. Mm -hmm. The text says that God places his oh. bow in the sky. And if you were reading your, your biblical text closely, from, especially for the NRSV, you would have seen this word and not rainbow. And there's a couple ways of thinking about rainbow, about this idea of God placing his rainbow in the clouds. You'll have to excuse my really awful drawing, but <laughs> one way of thinking about it is we've got our clouds, right? And God is going to kind of leave his, his bow kind of just like sitting up here so that he doesn't use it anymore, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of just sitting up here. He's like, look, I'm putting it up there. I'm walking away, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to do it again. If I get angry, I'll see my bow in the clouds, and I'm not going to do it again, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Another way of thinking about this is this way. Oh, God putting his bow in the sky saying, if I do something like this again, it's on me. I'm not going to walk away from this unscathed if I do something like this again. Okay? It's kind of like, and it's not quite like a Russian roulette kind of idea, but this idea that, like, I can't do this without, like, incurring harm myself. Right? But again, kind of like leaving this in the clouds, leaving his bow so that it will be a reminder to him not to do it again. And the biblical text does go one step further because in the biblical text, we have a promise. Mm -hmm. So let's look at that. If we turn to actually the end of 821, or the end of chapter 8, verse 21, right? This is when God, this is right after Noah um, offers the sacrifice, God smells it, it's pleasing, and he says, I'll never again curse the ground because of humankind. He does recognize that the inclination of human heart is evil from youth. Good realization to have there. And he says, uh, and I will never destroy every living creature as I have done. He says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. You notice this, this kind of pattern again? So here again we see this restoration 
of order. And that's what that text is doing right there. When it's saying sea time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, night, none of this order shall cease again. I'm not going to bring back the chaos. And after saying, I'm not going to bring back the chaos, then he blesses Abraham. And look at this, or not, Abraham, Noah. What sounds familiar in this blessing in verse 9, chapter 9? Sorry, not verse 9, chapter 9. Be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. Fruitful, multiply, fill. Right? This, this sounds really familiar, right? We just got through with creation. This is the same creation that was given before. God's saying, look, this, this blessing is, is back. Right? This, this is kind of tying it back again to creation, kind of telling you, this is recreation. I've established order, I'm blessing it, right? Which is exactly what we saw in Genesis 1, the creation of order and the blessings. Right? So that's happening again. Good. There is, however, a difference. What is different in this creation as opposed to the last creation? It's still fallen. Okay, there's this idea of fallenness. What specifically does the text mention that's different? Animals. What's that? The fear. fear of animals. Fear of animals, right? This is not something that was in Genesis 1 or 2. This idea of fear of animals, of, of some kind of animosity between creatures and humanity. Right? This is new. Right? This is also the first time that God says that you can eat meat. Mm -hmm. Supposedly before everybody's just vegetarians. Right? This is the first time that, that food is now going to come from animals, which again, we think back to that idea of milk and honey, mm -hmm. right? You have to work to hunt, right? Mm -hmm. The same way that you have to work to get food from the soil, mm -hmm. now you have to work to catch your food, right? That's part of this now too. But there is a prohibition even in that mm -hmm. where God says, whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human shall that person's blood be shed, right? So there's still this light establishing of order. Mm -hmm. right? so even though things are a little out of kilter, there's still going to be an order to kind of prevent that from getting out of hand, like we saw with Lamech, right? Mm -hmm. So we can kind of see this echoing back to Lamech. It's like, look, we're going to address this specifically. Okay. But God goes one step further in his promise to Noah, because he doesn't just promise Noah these things. But if you look at verse 8 and verse 9, what is the word that pops up there? Covenant. Covenant. This is a massive thing. This is what runs throughout Genesis and really throughout the Old Testament as defining God's relationship with his people is the idea of a covenant. 